I grew up on a farm. Everything seemed larger than life. Vivid colors. Big buildings and farm machinery. Trees that I would climb. And pets that we would keep. There is something magical about those early years. When I was 15, we moved out of the farm and into the city. And I would go back to visit every once in a while since my uncle and aunt still were on that farm. I remember going back after a couple of years and thinking, this isn't exactly how I remember it. The buildings didn't seem so big. The colors didn't seem as vibrant. The memories of childhood shrink with adulthood. And yet, there's a nostalgic warm feel to them. This is Vintage SF, and I'm Richard Rempel. Today, we're starting our look at the Ace Science Fiction Special Series 3. I have them all here. There's 12 of them. So there's six in black, and then six colorful spines to this series. The very first one here is The Wild Shore by Kim Stanley Robinson. Copyright, March 1984. I've gone through the introduction by Terry Carr in my introduction to this whole series, but let me read the specific part that is for The Wild Shore. Kim Stanley Robinson's The Wild Shore is the first published novel of a new SF writer whose short stories and novelettes have been nominated for both the Hugo and Nebula Awards. Its story of life in the United States as it might be after a nuclear strike that destroys our cities and reduces the nation to isolated enclaves of people living in the ruins and working their way back to civilization is familiar in its opening premises, but it adds a depth of characterization and background that has rarely been approached in science fiction before now. The Wild Shore is a novel of adventure, the story of a boy growing up rapidly in dangerous circumstances, and you'll find yourself turning the pages to see what happens next. This is the criterion for any good novel, but there's much more in the book, and I'll let you discover the rest for yourself. There will be more Ace Science Fiction specials coming soon, and each will be as different from the usual science fiction fair as this one is. I hope you'll watch for them. We are decades past what might have been 3,000 or even 10,000 nuclear strikes in the United States. These happened in a very unique and interesting way. I don't want to say too much more. I'd like you to discover it for yourself. But the United States never retaliated. They became a quarantine nation. Quarantine not only because of radiation, but also because of politics. The novel is set on the West Coast. You'll recognize some of the places between San Diego and L.A. But some of it has changed. All those nuclear strikes has changed the weather. The jet stream doesn't work like it used to. Southern California experiences winter. Small groups of people survive together in communities where there are farms and swap meets. The west coast of the United States is patrolled by the Japanese. They are stationed on Catalina Island, just off of L.A. The north and east coast are patrolled by Canada, and the Gulf Coast is patrolled by Mexico. The United States is watched by satellites, and we're not sure if there is weaponry in these satellites or if there are simply strikes from planes far, far above. But if any work is done to try to connect the small communities to each other, say a railroad track, it is quickly destroyed from above. Our setting is one small community near L.A. They farm and swap things with some communities that they do have close to them. They are isolated from farther away communities. Our protagonist is a young man within this community. The community is contacted by some people from San Diego. They bring news of a new American revolution. Their slogan may be hard to believe. Make America great again. I wonder if that phrase has been co-opted from this novel or if it's something that existed before 1984. Some of the young people go to San Diego and meet the mayor of San Diego. Along with them travels one of the oldest members of their community. They are asked to join this new group. They take it home to their people. Will they join what seems to be some sort of new revolution? Can they fight the Japanese? 
with their air power and satellites. This might seem to be the story of the novel, but the novel really is about communities, small communities, the relationships, growing up, and seeing your community, which seems so large to you, now seem to be so small. Innocence gone. Or I should say, innocence changed. One of the interesting narrative paths is the recording of history, to record your history in a book. The older man in the book educates our main protagonist in reading, and eventually he urges him to record his story. We get a glimpse of what has happened in the past as we read some other accounts by people who have written their stories. But what can you trust? How do you know what is true and what is not true? This novel works on many levels. It is a story of a nation pulling itself out of a horrible apocalyptic disaster. It is young people growing up in a small community. It is the harsh reality of choices that you make. It's finding a hope for tomorrow. Throughout the book, you see Kim Stanley Robinson's love of nature, his descriptions of forests and oceans and cliffsides and beaches are vivid and life-giving. The pastoral, community-building aspects of this novel reminded me of George R. Stewart's Earth Abides from 1949. While that novel is about surviving a deadly pandemic and building community again in the United States, this one is about a nuclear strike on three to 10,000 important sites in the United States. Robinson says they use some sort of low radiation yield. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but obviously people can still live. It's just all of their major centers are destroyed. They too are recovering, building community, and establishing themselves again on the land. One last thought. We can only live in the time that we're given, the time in history. We can only live in the place in geography the place that we've been born, and we can only live sociologically with the people of our place and our time. This is a remarkable first novel. I wouldn't call it a classic, but it certainly has been printed over and over again and still is in print. I give it 7.5 out of 10. So have you read The Wild Shore? I understand there are now two more novels in what is referred to as the Three Californias, the Gold Coast and Pacific Edge. At the time Pacific Edge came out, they referred to this trilogy as the Orange County Trilogy. There is an omnibus of these novels. Tori Essentials published them as Three Californias, the classic trilogy of three different futures. If you know more about this, let us know in the comments. Until next time, keep reading.